On the 11th day of October, Halloween gave to me 11 au pairs drowning, 10 children creeping, 9 rotties seizing, 8 snowy mazes, 7 bacons digging, 6 doorways bending, 5 children yowling, 4 zombie bulls, 3 haunted mirrors, 2 monster houses, and a fog that makes it hard to see. Hey there, everybody. Welcome to October 11th, the 11th day of Halloween in our 31 days of Halloween celebration. Uh, As always, thank you very much for listening. This is, of course, just a a goofy little thing that we're doing to celebrate the season. I am, uh, I'm, of course, enamored with the Halloween season. It means I get to sit around and watch horror movies, and that's kind of what I do. Uh, (laughs) That is my happy place. So we're coupling uh, a couple of these days together, chaining them together, to discuss uh, The Haunting of Bly Manor, which is, of course, the follow-up to uh, The Haunting of Hill House, the Netflix miniseries. And, you know, uh, we we did the first episode yesterday. You heard my my scattered rambling thoughts about it then. Um, Or maybe you're doing it now. Um, So, again, this will be a spoilery discussion I will say if you don't want to be spoiled, I would ultimately say, eh, maybe watch this, but don't necessarily put it at the top of your list. I don't know that it's a must watch. Um, and and maybe at some point I'll go back to it, but I, I don't think I was left feeling great about the series. There, there are things I very much like about the series. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but let, let's kind of get into it. Um, so it is the the second half of Bly Manor was uh, a little uneven because we did the first five episodes yesterday. We're doing the last four today, uh, episodes six, seven, eight, nine. And so to organize this a bit better, is, let me give you my general thoughts on the episodes. So the the sixth episode uh, had a lot to do with the uh, Henry Thomas character. If you heard the previous uh, the, the previous recording on Saturday, you will have heard me say, oh, they're really telegraphing this idea that Henry Thomas believes that he's responsible for uh, his his brother and and sister-in-law's death. And and that's, of course, exactly what happens. He has this Henry Thomas doppelganger uh, that fucks with him in this episode. But the whole idea is that he and... Uh, he had an affair with his sister-in-law, as played by Alex Esso. Always nice to see her pop up in something. Uh, a Mike Flanagan favorite, as we know from Doctor Sleep. So he's having an affair with her. It turns out that he's probably Flora's father, even though he doesn't know that. Uh, at least not initially, although he, you know, obviously comes to learn that throughout the course of the series. Um, Hannah is still not telling anybody she's a ghost in this episode, which I found to be problematic. And... This episode also has a scene that is sort of the culmination of this burgeoning relationship between uh, Jamie the gardener, the sassy gardener, and Danny, uh, our main character, the au pair, who has come to live uh, at Bly Manor. And it's a nice scene, but just like with everything in this show, I just wanted them to kind of get on with it. And it's a nice moment, but it would have been so much nicer if it had been about two minutes shorter and kind of gotten to the point. And then we get into episode seven, which is sort of the culmination of everything we've seen so far, where we have Peter, who is a ghost, and Rebecca, the previous au pair, who is now a ghost, where we start to get a sense of what really the the mechanism of the house is. Uh, where like the ghost, the the problem with being a ghost at Bly Banner is eventually you start to lose your identity, and that's what's sort of happening to Rebecca and Peter, even as they are inhabiting the bodies of uh, Miles and Flora. And the notion is that you kind of get stuck in all these memories, and after a while, you you start to forget what those memories are, and you just become this faceless creature that does what it does without any awareness of why it does it. And, you know, thematically that does tie into what the show as a whole seems to be discussing, which is the notion of how do you kind of carry on with your life 
after the loss of a loved one. You know, that's where uh, that's where Danny is. Jamie is really the only character who seems to be kind of grounded, even though she has clearly lost someone. But it was it was a long time ago, and and that has faded. And you know, hence the theme of the show that you know all emotion fades over time. That time is merciless. And the argument Jamie makes in the show is that's what makes life beautiful is its brevity. And and because it is so precious, that's that's what makes you uh, uh, like treasure each day. And you know, one day at a time is the thing that uh, she later says to to Danny. And you know, I I can get behind that. It, it's a fine discussion for the show. I don't think it's handled with near the deafness and and the sense of resolution that comes with something like uh, the Haunting of Hill House, where it was really even in the di- 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 the diversions, and we'll talk about this more in episode eight here in a second. But in, at any rate, getting back to uh, the mechanism of the haunting, so they're trapped there. Um, you know, finally, uh, uh, Danny sees these ghosts and gets tied up, bonked on the head, and tied up uh, for her troubles, and uh, finally, and there's some back and forth with. You know, Peter and Rebecca as ghosts arguing about like, hey, we got to take over these kids for real now because we're both starting to slip away. And so we've got to inhabit their bodies for good. And so uh, that's what happens. You know, Peter hops into Miles. And when he does so, there's a little bit of trickery because uh, Miles uh, it has, you know, pushed away to some little corner of his head. In theory, gone forever. But Rebecca has made a kind of a quiet deal with Flora that she's not she's having a crisis of conscience that even though she might fade away to nothing, she cannot subject a child to, you know, being a passenger in their own body for their the course of their lives, one presumes. So um, once Miles uh, has to take off, Ma- the Peter possessed Miles has to take off because somebody shows up uh, at Bly- Hannah is is starting to uh, make a ruckus because in her ghost form she has decided she is going to uh, try to help. And so Flora and the ghost of Rebecca help Danny get out. And as they're rushing out of the place, uh, Danny runs face to face with the, the main ghost, as we come to learn, who is the woman in white uh, who has no face that killed Peter. And so then uh, the episode ends with like literally the ghost grabbing Danny the same way that she grabbed Peter, who, as we know, ended up dead. And then we get into episode eight, uh, which is a complete throwback episode, uh, mostly in black and white, in which we learn the history of why Bly Manor is haunted in the first place. Uh, It is the story of uh, Kate Siegel, uh, who is Mike Flanagan's wife, plays uh, Viola uh, Worthington the fifth or something forget the last name and she and her sister inherit Bly Manor uh, Viola uh, the the older sister does not want to give up their power their control over the estate so they marry or she marries uh, a dude that she knows she can kind of control who doesn't really have an interest in running the the family business and that kind of thing so Viola continues to live in Bly Manor to control Bly Manor even though she gets married and conforms to the standards of the time. But uh, she gets tuberculosis after she has a kid, and the priest comes in and is like, hey, I've got to give you your last rites, and she says, I will not go. I will not leave Bly Manor. Get the fuck out of here. And so she she holds on for years and years with uh, consumption or whatever she's got, and uh, they call it the lung disease, but anyway... Could have just been lung cancer. Who knows? At any rate, uh, <laughs> Viola w- lives long enough to see that uh, her husband and her sister are potentially developing feelings for one another because she's locked away in a sick room. She can't, you know, because she is in in theory infectious. She can't really associate with her daughter. Uh, she can't sleep in her husband's bed anymore. And, but she lives in this existence for, you know, years and years and years uh, until finally uh, the the father and the kid go out for the day 
and uh, the sister, Perdita is her name, um, just is tired of dealing with it and also uh, dealing with Viola being kind of a bitch to her over the years and murders her. And so uh, at one point, um, she packs away all of her fine dresses and jewelry for which she is well known into this big chest. And the, uh, uh, the like, there are three keys that lock the chest. And uh, this is going to be sort of the uh, the inheritance for the daughter. That these clothes and, and the jewels inside are, are worth quite a bit of money. And it she wraps it up in a shawl and scatters flower petals over. And she's like, you know, when she turns 18, give her the keys to this chest. She'll open it. And there in a bed of flowers will be my gift to her. And so when she is murdered, when Viola is murdered, she basically goes to live in the chest. Um, I would say question mark, but that's what happens. And <laughs> it just seems weird, but she's like, this is what she loves her daughter more than anything. And so she is giving her this gift. And, and so she waits to uh, presumably protect it. But the family is starting to fall on hard times, and Perdita, the younger sister, busts into this chest to steal a bunch of shit, but there in the chest is the ghost of Viola waiting for her, and just strangles the shit out of her. As soon as, <laughs> as, soon as Perdita opens the chest, Viola kills her, uh, the first victim of the ghost of Bly Manor. And, uh, and, and so they say, uh, the narrator of the story says... Um, that she created this kind of gravity well where anyone who happened to die in uh, Bly Manor was kept there because of just the force of Viola's will. But over time, uh, the memory of why she was so enraged and why she roamed the halls uh, looking for her child of, uh, in Bly Manor, that that faded away too. So all that was left was this purposeless creature that went from the lake where the uh, the the chest was dumped after, you know, the wife opened it and died. And these being olden times, the father was like, that chest is fucking cursed. We're going to dump it in the, <laughs> in the pond and we're never coming back. So that's what they do. Uh, but that, you know, that leaves Viola uh, there to continually leave the lake periodically when she wakes as a consciousness uh, and then roams the halls and, and happen, you know, kills anyone who happens in her path tries to stop, stop her from that uh, uh, that predestined uh, sort of route. And it's all really fine. Um, again, it feels like we spend a lot of time going over these characters that don't really matter at the end of the day. And I again, I kept thinking of Hill House and how even all the diversions back in time and so forth were all kind of leading to the conclusion. You know, and they're and they're the same characters. They're younger versions of them, but they're the same characters. And so, spending really a, an entire episode where we just get the backstory of the house, like it, it felt jarring. It, it was like I the, the when last we left Danny, she is in the clutches of this ghost, and now we understand what the threat of the ghost is, and that no matter what happens to Danny, like she's going to be cursed to. Uh, remain at Bly Manor. So the episode ends the same way that episode seven does. Episode seven and episode eight have the exact same ending, that cliffhanger ending, which is just the ghost having Danny in hand again. And this going into the ninth episode, I was like, man, this is a real bummer that I feel like the narrative has not been moved at all. Yes. I understand how the haunted house works now, but I feel like I could have gotten that in little drips and drabs throughout the series. And, you know, at the moment when uh, the ghost of Viola grabs uh, Danny, that could have been scary because I know what that threat is instead of just like, OK, I, I know that I'm telling you a story, but let me stop that story to tell you this other story. OK, now back to our main story. Now that you know what the story of this other character is. Um, it just felt jarring and, and the episode isn't bad. In fact, it's probably one of my favorites of the season just cause it's more of a traditional ghost story, but it was just disappointing because it, it felt like we weren't moving the plot at all. You know, like I said, I, I knew more detail, but I had a general idea of how all this worked in the first place. And, and so 
going into the ninth episode, uh, it, you know, this all plays out kind of quickly, um, where basically, uh, Hannah tries to stop, uh, the Viola ghost who walks right through Hannah and this ghost on ghost contact apparently fucks Hannah up real bad and she can't really hang on to herself for much longer or something. Um, then the, the little girl, Flora, who is not possessed, uh, <laughs> tricks the ghost into letting Danny go. And so the ghost really, by all she does is just be like, Hey, please, uh, let my friend go. And the ghost does because all the ghost really knows is that occasionally there will be a little girl uh, in the bed. And that's what she's there to see. She doesn't remember it's her daughter. She just remembers a little girl. And so uh, the ghost then takes Flora and starts taking her away. And uh, Danny is, you know, all choked and, and not able to uh, to pursue Meanwhile, uh, Henry Thomas has shown up because now that he's had this kind of come to Jesus, like, oh, I've really fucked up and not been responsible for my family. Uh, he shows up to try to help, um, gets there just in time to get choke slammed by the ghost and, and killed for a second. And so as a ghost, there's a great moment where it's like Henry Thomas is a ghost. He sees Hannah, who is beside him, who is also a ghost. Danny is being carried by another ghost. And it was like, there's only one human being in this shot, and this feels a little bit silly. And in fact, th what I kept thinking was through throughout much of this that this I know it's based on Henry James and all that, but when you get right down to it, it feels like a very extended plot of a supernatural episode about two spirits trying to inhabit two children so they can be together again, and that's all this is really about. So aside from Viola, which. We only learned it's about that in the last episode, but fair enough. So, <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, finally, um, it's Danny who saves the, the day. Uh, I'm sorry. Danny was not in the clutches of, of the ghost going into the lake. Uh, she has the daughter. I, I'm sorry, but Danny who has been choke slammed, uh, upstairs, uh, she runs after, uh, the, the ghost gets there just as, you know, the ghost is about to descend into the depths of, of this pond or lake with uh, with Flora, with the little girl. And um, there's a moment that's kind of fun uh, or kind of nice um, where uh, Rebecca, as the ghost of the au pair that was there before, is like, hey, why don't you let me in and I will take over for now. Like, you don't have to deal with this horrible moment. You can go be with your mother. I'll take this. Uh, because she's already done it once because we saw earlier in, in one of the episodes where, uh, Peter possesses her to get her to go into the lake. Like she, she said she wanted to be with him and, and so he jumps at her body and then kind of crawled at her by killing her. He's like, look, we're together now. And she's like, this is fucked up. Uh, and in fact, one of the best, one of the best things in, in the seventh episode, I think is after she dies, you see her like in the reeds screaming and wailing and crying. And it's really sweet. Um, like as a horror film moment where you're like, man, I wish more of this show were this. Uh, and that's another big complaint I have with the whole thing is that it's just not very supernatural for a supernatural show. Not the television program, supernatural, uh, that I referenced earlier. I mean, as a supernatural horror, uh, series, it's not all that supernatural. Like all the ghost stuff is kind of backloaded in the, the last two episodes. And even in that uh, eighth episode, wh which is all about the origins of the haunting of Bly Manor, the haunting part of it is like the last 15 minutes. It doesn't get to the ghost story all that quickly anyway. Uh, but yeah, so uh, Danny gets there in time and then she uses this phrase that Peter and Rebecca used with the kids to kind of invite them in where she says, not me, us. And I guess that just works in general on ghosts or something. I'm not sure why, uh, <laughs> why the ghost of Viola was, you know, sort of hornswoggled by this, but okay. And anyway, so she goes inside Danny. Viola does, uh, goes inside her all pair Danny 
Um, and in doing so, that breaks the spell that Viola has on all the other ghosts, just kind of magically. And then you see Rebecca kind of fade away, and there's a moment where Miles, who was fucked, like, at, at this point, everybody was like, Miles is gone. Like, you, he will never come back. But then there's Miles standing beside Peter, and Peter's like, sorry about that, buddy. And then is gone. And again, it resolves itself very quickly, and, and in a... So quickly, I would argue, that uh, it was not very satisfying. And and so the back end of the show is sort of Danny living with this sort of terminal illness inside her of this ghost that eventually she's like, the ghost eventually is one day going to be so powerful and she's going to take over. And in the meantime, Jamie, uh, our sassy gardener, is like that's fine. We can live a life together. I'll be there with you when this when this happens. And and sure enough, like they live together for years and years and are in love and have a wonderful life. And then you know six seven eight years later, uh, she starts to see Danny starts to see the reflection of the the woman in the mirror, uh, the Viola, uh, the the faceless ghost version of Viola, and um one night wakes up and is almost going to hurt Jamie. And so she returns to Bly Manor and the last sort of moments of the story within Bly Manor are Jamie showing up, uh, for one last trip to Bly where there is, uh, she swims down into the lake and, and finds the body of, uh, Danny who has gone into the waves. And then the narrator takes over here and says, you know, this, she is a ghost, but because she was so good in life and meant no harm, she walks harmlessly among uh, the walls of Bly Manor. Like, the, the the haunting of Bly Manor proper has stopped. There is never going to be more ghosts or anything. It's just going to be this one. And it's this uh, very lonely existence where you don't know anything and blah, blah, blah. It's very sad. Very tragic ending for our main character. Which is fine. You know, I, uh, there's... There's plenty that I, I wish had led up to uh, something more with this relationship other than it's just going to be doomed. But uh, I will say that stuff was at least, you know, emotionally affecting and, and that sort of thing. That was kind of the best part of the show for me was this relationship between um, Jamie and, uh, and Danny. As statistically unlikely as it may be that they would have met, uh, it's still kind of nice. And, and in fact... Uh, we cut back to Carla Gugino at the end of all this. And Carla Gugino uh, says, uh, and like I said, this wasn't a, a short story. Apologize uh, to everyone who had to listen to eight hours uh, of this. <laughs> but um, when pressed on the details, she's like, eh, maybe it's there, maybe it's not. And w at the end of the day, what you come to realize is that this has been Jamie all along. Surprise, surprising nobody, I don't think. Um, cause she has the same like Scottish accent that Jamie does. And that's the only character on the show that has uh, other than Peter has that, that kind of Scottish accent. Uh, yeah. So she sees, uh, the wedding crew off and it turns out that she is there to attend the wedding of Flora, Flora and, uh, Henry Thomas and, and, uh, the kid miles. Um, there, there's a conversation, at one point with Owen, who has started his own restaurant, um, about how they don't remember anything. Like, they, they remember, the way he puts it is, they remember the shape of it, of the memory, but they don't remember the details. And they don't remember, uh, they know they, they, as children, they lived in Bly Manor for a little while after their parents died. But they don't remember all the ghosts and hauntings and possessions. And Henry Thomas uh, isn't ever going to tell them. And when... And Jamie and Danny are there having this discussion, and Danny kind of realizes, like, oh, they're not going to remember me, and they're never going to know that I'm basically dooming myself uh, on their behalf. But it's kind of Jamie who who picks up that banner and is, like, you know, uh, there to support her and so forth and be there uh, for her. And, and, again, this gets to the larger theme of the show, like, and it ends with just uh, this narration about, that. well, it's not really a... a a ghost story, it's a love story, and maybe all love stories are ghost stories at heart. Um, because we we miss people, and there's a conversation that she has with 
um, with Flora, who is getting married, who's an adult now. And she worries about uh, having loving someone deeply and having this fear that uh, they're going to die, that they're going to leave you alone. And then, and then you're going to be shattered and broken because the, this person that you love so deeply is gone. And Carlo Gugino says, you know, you just can't focus on that. And, and what happens is w- eventually they will go and it will break you. But over time, it'll fade. And you start to remember these moments. And the thing, the thing that you realize ultimately is that no one ever really dies. You know, they're, they can die, but they're never gone. There, there are always these pieces of them that live on after. And, and for uh, Danny, those pieces are Flora. It's Miles, you know. Um, that's not pointed out. It's one of the few things that's handled with a, a degree of subtlety in this show, which is not always the most subtle. And that is kind of it. Like, I keep going about this. And l- so let me give you my final thoughts on it, which are ultimately... Um, there are things about it that are really good and well done. Like, it's not a, a show without talented people behind it. But I don't think it adds up to much. Um, I don't think it's very scary. It's certainly... Like, there are a couple of episodes of Haunting of Hill House that I, I think are terrifying. I never felt real fear in this show, ever. Uh, there were there were no real scares. Uh, I can't even think of a good jump scare that might have caught me off guard. I felt like it meandered. I felt like it 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 telegraphed too much, and so when it tried to surprise you, it didn't do a very good job of it as a series. Um, and all that adds up to being kind of a bummer. Uh, I I really wanted to enjoy this. I went into it really excited, and as the show wore on, I realized like eh, like I said, it's a, a really long episode of Supernatural that's r- much more classy. It's a classy show. Don't get me wrong. But uh, despite all that class, uh, it just, you know, it looks good. There's good performances in it. There's some of the ghosts. Uh, like, the thing I thought about uh, as I was kind of wandering around today thinking about this show uh, is I I think six months from now, I much like the ghosts of Bly Manor, I will not recall a thing about it. It will be uh, as faceless as its ghost. That's probably what I'll remember is... It's faceless ghosts, and by the way, there was a secret ghost for like five ep- for the whole show practically. And there's there's a secret ghost, and nobody ever, like at no point does anyone ever say like she was a fucking ghost this whole time. Anyway, uh, like all the times we were just sitting around chatting and having drinks after work, she was a ghost. Then she was dead. Ah, oh, goodness. Um, <laughs> so. That's it. Uh, it. Listen, as always, drop me a line if you've seen the show and you disagree with me. That that's cool. Uh, you know, I'm not telling anybody they're uh, they're wrong for liking something. And maybe at a certain point, I'll go back and give this another shot. I am, you know, a- after this long runtime and feeling like there's a whole lot of wheel spinning in some of these episodes, eh, it's, it, I'm gonna need a stiff drink to do that. But uh, regardless, we're moving on. There's going to be some new stuff. There's going to be some old stuff that I know I'm going to love. Uh, so maybe you don't include Haunting of Bly Manor in your your Halloween celebrations. But if you do, uh, l- drop me a line about it. Or just drop me a line about whatever you're, uh, you're watching and or doing for the uh, Halloween celebration. You can do that at bo, B-O at legionpodcasts.com. Uh, and... That'll do it. We'll be back on Monday. Monday morning, start of a new week. Uh, wash the the stain of uh, Bly Manor off of us and, and come back renewed and revigorated. Uh, and there's going to be some great stuff that we're going to talk about next week. Some stuff that I'm about to go watch right now and I couldn't be more excited. So, um, everybody, have a great Sunday and, uh, and I will talk to you tomorrow uh, with day 12 of the 31 Days of Halloween. Talk to you then. <laughs>